Hello, I'm Barry Shaw, and this is The View from Israel. Today's show is going to be the start of a short series that I'm running on the need to counter the hate and the threats that Jewish students, pro-Israel students, are suffering on campuses. And doing it, unfortunately, we're having to have the defense of law and legal organizations in order to help. And today we're starting off the, the series by introducing you to an organization called Zachor Legal Institute. And for that, I have my first guest, Ron Machon. Welcome to the show, Ron. Thank you very much, Barry. Now, I understand that the Zahor Legal Institute is, a, we call it a legal think tank and an advocacy organization. How long has it been going? And uh, can you tell us something about your background? Uh, sure. So um, we started, we meaning my partner, Mark Reendorfer and I started Zahor Legal Institute uh, around the year 2015. Um, uh, basically, I have a background in high tech. I worked for a number of years in high tech before I made Aliyah and uh, from the U.S. and after I made Aliyah. Um, and Mark and I had uh, always been in touch over the years about a variety of different uh, what we felt was um, bad portrayals, negative portrayals, anti-Semitic portrayals even of Israel in the news. Um, I talked to him on the telephone about six or seven years ago. He was from the San Francisco Bay Area, and at the time there was um, the dock workers in Oakland were boycotting a Zim Israeli ship from being unloaded. And so, you know, I, I'm not a lawyer. I asked him, who was a lawyer, if uh, if this is legal. And, and basically, we created the Zahor Legal Institute at that point to answer that question. And over these last or se seven years or so, we've been basically uh, doing research and, uh, and publishing this research to identify the variety of different ways. In fact, the, the, what the BDS movement is advocating for is in fact not, le not legal in the US, besides the fact that it is in many cases anti-Semitic um, and sometimes even some of the BDS uh, supporters are are related to, to terrorist organizations. And so there's a variety of different issues. And we've spent the last seven years focusing on researching and then and then propagating it to the public, uh, the, the variety of ways in which there are issues with uh, the BDS movement so that all the organizations that are defending Israel and defending Jews, whether it's on campus or in commercial settings or in governmental settings, uh, have the legal resources they need to be able to uh, make their cases. So mainly, um, Zahor is uh, really fighting a lot of the, uh, what you call the BDS, the boycotts, divestments and sanctions uh, activities that uh, are going on. You mentioned this, uh, this incident at the docks in Oakland against uh, an Israeli ship, which is against Selective. Um, the question that a lot of people ask me, and I'm going to ask you, is are the actions of BDS, boycotts, divestments and sanctions, are their actions legal? Uh, there's a question that many people don't really understand, and can you give us an answer to that? Sure. Let me give you a couple of uh, let me give you a couple of cases. Um, before we started to operate and do our research, the what was out in the public domain was basically there are federal laws in the United States that oppose the Arab League boycott of Israel. The Arab League boycott of Israel. Um, was a boycott that started even before the the state of Israel was founded in 1948. Um, the the Arab League, the, all of the Arabic and uh, Islamic countries are part of the Arab League. Um, got together and basically said, you know, we are going to boycott Israel, and even more than that, anyone that does business with Israel, we will boycott them as well. Um, the United States didn't take very kindly to such uh, such rules because basically what was going on there is that if American companies wanted to do business with the Arab League members, they had to boycott Israel. 
and certify they were boycotting Israel. And essentially what that was doing from the federal government's point of view was having outside foreign agencies dictate public policy. It wasn't the, uh, it, it wasn't the mission of the United States to boycott Israel. In fact, Israel and America, of course, are very friendly. They have many trade, uh, big trade types of uh, deals and, and governmental uh, relations that are very positive. And the United States government didn't, uh, didn't want foreign agencies coming in and and, uh, and de defining public foreign policy in the United States. Um, but what the BDS movement said at the time was, well, that's all fine and good, but in fact, we're not a uh, country. And because we're not a country, these, these laws, these federal laws that are targeting the, the Arab League movement are not relevant to us. And so that was, that was what was in the public domain, and nobody was coming back and, and pushing back on that. And so our first research and publications in, in uh, law journals were in fact meant to come back against that and show that these these laws were in fact uh, is restricting not just uh, countries but also non-state actors like uh, the BDS movement uh, uh, supporters and their and the organizations that were that were financing and directing their activities were also bound by the. Uh, by the federal laws in the United States. So, and and, and we have we have since then published four uh, academic articles in in prestigious legal journals in the U.S. that have been used hundreds and hundreds of times uh, and and referenced by by states that are creating anti BDS laws and 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 cases where these laws are are um, uh, targeted. Um, that the, the the research that we've used is basically the go-to types of documents that use that are used to defend Israel in the in the legal sphere. In in the simple case, let's say of the uh, of the courts of the of the Zim boats, the Zim ships, um, it turns out that a few months ago, uh, again, Zim was uh, ship was targeted in Oakland again um, by BDS supporters. In this case, we were six years later. We knew a lot more than we knew when we first started Zahor, and we actually were able to file a complaint with the National Labor Relations Board. This is the board that regulates unions, including the uh, dock workers. And this was the first time ever that a um, that a, a case had been filed uh, with the National Labor Relations Board against a boycott of Israel. Uh, and what the, the National Labor Relations Board actually came back and said, we uh, we accept your legal reasoning here. There is not enough evidence, though, for us to show that it was the union doing the boycotting and not these external BDS supporters. But we have this information on uh, on our files, and we are are looking for them. And if such a thing happens again, we now uh, know what we need to look for. And so this is, this is one of those things that you build evidence and you build evidence. But the unions now are are. On, are aware now that there are the, the National Labor Relations Board that regulates them as well as external organizations that are watching them. They're restricted from engaging in secondary boycotts, and they, I believe, will be much more careful when such a thing, if such an event happens again with the Zimbos coming. Uh, I can tell you also that um, there were a lot of Israeli legal organizations as well as um, uh, Israeli uh, institutions, for instance, Israeli Institute of Strategic Studies, many others, um, together with, um, with activist groups who um, got into uh, conversations with some of the state leaders, whether the governors, the attorney generals, and pointed out to them that when certain boycott activities were taking place in their states, they were really against uh, uh, the laws of that particular state. And there's been a lot of success. Perhaps you can tell us if you know, if you remember what, how many, what the numbers are of the, uh, the states within the United States who have adopted anti-BDS uh, law and, uh, on their statute books. So today there are 32 states in the U.S. that have anti-BDS legislation of one sort or another. These are states that are basically saying some variation of 
we believe that uh, the BDS boycott of, of Israel is a discriminatory boycott. And we as a state uh, want to show that we don't support such a discriminatory boycott. So either the penalty for engaging in a BDS, a BDS boycott in the state can either be that the state itself will not do business with that entity or that they will divest from the, uh, from the boycotting com company or even a combination of the two. And so there are 32 such states today that have such a law. I mean, to me, that is a, a, great, a great success in and of itself. It just simply should put, so shows that the states, uh, more than half of the states, have gone out and shown their, I would say, you can, might call it a support for Israel, but I think equally you can say they have recognized the discrimination that is inherent in the BDS movement. So in addition, though, to these states having laws, there's also then the ability to enforce the laws, as you alluded to, uh, uh, Barry. And one of the cases where we're seeing that a lot today, right now, actually, is, is a case related to Ben & Jerry's and Unilever. Uh, ben & Jerry's, about uh, three or four months ago, I guess it would be, um, announced that they were going to stop selling uh, their, their ice cream in uh, Judah and Samaria, basically over the Green Line in Israel. Um, the, the parent company of Ben & Jerry's is Unilever, who is a uh, publicly traded company in the United States. Um, and basically, they were have been found by a variety now, I, I believe it is at least five or six different states have been already found in violation of those states' anti-BDS laws, and they've triggered the penalties, whether it is divestment or whether it is um, uh, whether it is uh, just not doing business with Unilever itself. But this is one of the uh, cases in which there is a, we see a positive result from these anti-BDS laws. We saw that also with Airbnb a couple years ago. Airbnb announced that they were going to not give service only to Jewish homeholders, again, in, in the disputed, what they call the disputed territories of Israel, in, in Judah and Samaria, in eastern Jerusalem, in the Golan Heights, only for the Jewish uh, homeowners there. So they were actually even making a, a judgment on who was right and who was wrong here. A state started to invoke their anti-BDS laws, a variety of different lawsuits came, and at the end, after six months, BD, Airbnb decided to rescind their boycott. In, for at this point right now, uh, Unilever is still, uh, have not reined in really their, uh, their subsidiary Ben & Jerry's. Um, in addition to these anti-BDS laws that are being triggered, there's also now requests from congressmen to the SEC to investigate whether Unilever is violating the shareholder, maximizing shareholder, uh, shareholders value uh, principle by allowing their uh, one of their subsidiaries to implement this this uh, uh, boycott of, of portions of Israel, which has caused the stock of Unilever to drop in a gigantic way. And when we, when I say this dropped in a gigantic way, it means dropped even much more than the, the performed much less good than let's say the overall market or performed much much less good than comparable types of companies so something is happening there that caused causing unilever to perform very very poorly since since their subsidiary announced the boycott of these portions of Israel. And I don't believe, and I think a lot of people uh, would agree with me, that their boy that the allowing their subsidiary to boycott is not irrelevant to this um, to this poor performance. And this is going to be something that we hope will open the eyes of, of the SEC and will open the eyes also of Unilever shareholders that will demand that the board of directors of the companies look out for their interests. Have you been able to identify the leaders of the BDS movement? By that, I'm talking about the uh, political or other persuasions that makes them so vehemently uh, anti-Semitic and anti-Israel. What sort of form do those organizations take? Are they what you call these sort of right-wing uh, white supremacists? Are they left, far left? Are they belong to Islamic groups or whatever? Have you been able 
I've been able to identify the perpetrators. Um, it's mostly accepted that the BDS movement in the form that it exists in now uh, started, I believe it's 20 years ago. I think they had just now the 20th anniversary of the uh, of the Durban conference in South Africa, uh, which turned into, it was sponsored, I believe, by the United Nations, and it turned into a real anti-Israel, anti-Semitic uh, event. And there were calls to boycott Israel. There's always been calls to boycott Israel, uh, but there was a new call to boycott Israel's by the nonprofits. Uh, something different, I would say, than what had been going on until then was mostly the boycott of Israel was was being sponsored by the Arab League. So this was new groups that were sponsoring it. it within the Palestinian Authority, there is a group called the Palestinian Camp Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of, of Israel called PAC-B, P-A-C-B-I. And they are really the main focus and the main organizers of the BDS movement. This is something that's part of the Palestinian Authority. And the funding and the, uh, the main management and direction of the worldwide BDS movement, it really comes from here. This is an organization that sits on the same committees with uh, US designated terror organizations. And from our perspective, and there's been plenty of uh, reports about this, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs came out with a report uh, called uh, Terrorists in Suits, which basically showed that the BDS movement was a, a, or it was a movement that had the same goals as their friends, their terrorist friends that were sitting at the same table with them. But whereas the terrorism didn't seem to be working in a way that was going to cause Israel uh, to, to not exist, uh, they decided to open up a second front, was something that was maybe more socially acceptable and more uh, friendly looking, more civil rights looking. They called it this BDS movement. Um, and this is the origin. This is the origin. This is this is the the main uh, sponsors of the BDS movement and and funders are coming from this PAC B, and they are working with a variety of uh, organizations in uh, in in the U.S. and really throughout the world. And the main student organization that is. Uh, has picked up the baton, I would say, in the university settings in the U.S. is a organization called Students for Justice in Palestine. But there are a variety of organizations, some of them uh, Arabic or Muslim, and some of them uh, some of them that don't directly relate at all. Uh, sometimes they've been co-opted into uh, into joining with the uh, with the uh, BDS movement in targeting Israel. And you're right, though, Barry, sometimes it comes from the right and sometimes it comes from the left. I mean, we've even seen cases where neo-Nazi parties in the U.S. have uh, cooperated with, um, with uh, pro-BDS types of organizations uh, for their common goal of targeting Israel. And we know that this happened uh, during the uh, Nazi Germany, where the Nazis uh, co cooperated in certain cases with uh, with Arabic leaders in the Middle East, um, but we see that is happening again. And uh, you know, it's not it's not isolated to the left. It's not isolated to the right. It's basically isolated to people that is, see the BDS movement as a way to target is Israel as a proxy for uh, targeting Jews. <laughs> And they find that people that find it distasteful, I would say, to talk about, uh, to, to have discrimination towards Jews are more open to engage or at least listen to those that would say uh, to hide their hatred for Jews behind uh, anti-Zionism or hatred for Israel. Just to corroborate uh, something you said, Ron, um, I, I produced, with the, under the view from Israel, a, a very detailed uh, interview show with uh, Maurice Hirsch. Maurice Hirsch is, is the, well, used to be the IDF uh, military prosecutor, and he is intimately connected with the uh, Palestinian terror organization and, and the lawyers that represent them. What I'm coming to is that um, 
there were six or seven Palestinian NGOs uh, that were um, banned in Israel by being actual active members of terrorist organizations supporting the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which is an internationally designated terror organization. And it's maybe something that you as a whole could look into. And uh, I, with the cooperation with uh, us at the Israel Institute of Strategic Studies, NGO Monister, Palestine Media Watch. Uh, but the video, I'd invite your lawyers also to go to the video under the view from Israel, talks about the uh, Palestinian so-called human rights organizations who are aiding and abetting and actually have members belonging to an internationally designated terrorist. But some of the, another part of the deviousness of some of the anti-Israel organizations I, I want to come on to, because you highlighted um, an organization called APAC. Now, people generally know APAC as being an American Israel public affairs organization. But there was another organization which called themselves APAC, and I believe it was headed by somebody called Paul Larude or something like that. Um, can you tell us some of this, uh, some of this uh, anecdotal information and evidence of the deviousness of some of the anti-Israel activists and organizations? Yeah, this is this is a kind of an interesting case in that there's actually a, a anti-Israel organization that I'm assuming not coincidentally, it shows the acronym APAC to uh, coincide and I would say confuse those uh, that know APAC as, the, uh, as a lobbying organization in the US uh, for, for some uh, Israel issues. And you know, it's, 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 this is a small organization. I'm sure that they're probably not uh, making a gigantic impact in anything, but just the fact that an organization would go out there and, you know, be known as APAC and be fundraising and maybe have friends of Israel unwittingly uh, fund them, give them money is, is something that, uh, it, you know, it's, it, it's beyond, it's beyond the obvious, but the bottom line is, that you know we're a legal institute and we do legal research and that legal research is is the thing that we've talked about until now but when we get to Zionists on campus the the project that we have on campuses you'll see some of the activisms that we're engaged in and the example that you gave there is one of a million uh, things that we've come across where this is really you know fighting in the gutters and uh, you know there's there's nothing too low that uh, that uh, these anti-Israel activists will not sink to to defame in Israel. And so in order to defend against them, sometimes we have to be ready to roll up our sleeves and, uh, you know, and fight back. I understand also that the, um, the founder of Zachor, Mark uh, Greendorfer, um, wrote an article about the continuing hypocrisy of the ACLU. Um, you obviously know what the ACLU is. You can explain this to our viewers. But um, um, uh, Mark made the point that although the ACLU um, it, it, it really goes after people who discriminate against uh, gays, blacks, Asians, and other communities, uh, about that, it seems that uh, discriminating against Jews is a protected political activity. Can you explain to our viewers what the ACLU is and what Mark was uh, getting at in his article? Sure, uh, Barry. So the ACLU is the American Civil U Liberties Union, um, and it is the preeminent organization in the legal organization in the U.S. in uh, protecting the civil uh, civil liberties of uh, individuals and organizations. Um, it is an organization that. Uh, Many Jewish people in America supports, and many others, of course, too. Um, and the idea here is that they are considered a unbiased, nonpartisan organization protecting civil rights. Um, but what we've seen over the last years is that seems to be mutating a bit, mutating a bit in the way that we found almost in some ways it's quite similar to uh, to Barry, what you described about the BDS movement, that some of their members are that that control the BDS movement or that are managing the BDS movement are also members of the PLFP. The ACLU has 
a number of people in the organizations that are either currently or previously have been employed by organizations that support the boycott of, of Israel. Um, they're an organization that support the rights of states to uh, create laws against discrimination of a variety of sorts based upon gender, sexual orientation, a, a variety of different types of, um, of, of protections for this groups that are discriminated against, with the exception of one, and, and that is the exception of Jews. Uh, they have come across very strongly and said that uh, the anti-BDS laws are in fact, violations of protected speech, uh, and they are and they're and they are something that really should not be on the books. They're in fact not constitutional. Every other form of anti-discrimination law seems to be uh, seems to be acceptable and and positive from the ACLU's point of view, except for anti-discrimination laws that protect Jews. This is something that we think it is very, it's, it's not something in the last year or two years, it's been going on more and more and more. And our report, which we call uh, the ACLU is not your parents ACLU, it's meant to show supporters of Israel, it's meant to show uh, the courts in which the ACLU is operating, that this organization which comes across as being nonpartisan and, and unbiased, in fact, in the specific case of Israel, is is very biased and not and can't claim to and is very partisan, I would say. And and it's important, at least for the people that are supporting them or have supported them in the past, are the courts that are accepting their legal arguments to understand where they're coming from. I'm uh, I'm coming uh, towards a point where I want to concentrate more on what's happening on campuses. But before I do that, and I lead into it, basically, I wrote a book called Fighting Hamas, BDS and Antisemitism. Uh, I, I wrote this book about six, seven years ago uh, because I had ample evidence then of the uh, hybrid link between people who uh, are anti-Semitic and those who are hyperactive in anti-Israel activism, Israel being, of course, the corporate Jew, uh, the, the Jewish state. Um, can you give any anecdotal uh, evidence from your experience from a legal point of view of some of the people who are attacking uh, Israel also being um, either rabid or uh, subtle anti-Semites? We produced a report uh, together with StopAntiSemitism.org, it called the New Antisemites, and that report was focused on uh, BDS supporters in uh, in the campus settings and uh, their messaging, which was very anti-Semitic, uh, according to the uh, definition that we and many support, which is the uh, IRA International Holocaust Remembrance uh, Alliance's working definition of anti-Semitism. And so we showed in that report how the uh, the, the BDS supporters uh, on campuses, the student groups, were violating a variety of the IRA work, IRA's working definition of anti-Semitism examples. For instance, uh, and this is one of the main cases, is holding Israel to a double standard, uh, focusing on the things that they claim Israel is doing uh, wrong, where there are many other countries that are doing uh, the things that they accuse of Israel at a much, much, much higher level that they ignore. They simply hold Israel to a completely different standard. Um, they were accusing Jews sometimes of being more loyal to Israel than America or having dual loyalties. Uh, they, uh, they, this is again a violation of the IRA's working definition, comparing Israel to uh, its policies to uh, Nazi Germany and a variety of others. And these are all detailed with specific examples in, in our report. Um, we have also seen that, uh, as you've alluded to, Barry, it's not just a commercial boycott, but we're starting to see uh, pushes for academic boycotts. The uh, Middle East Studies Association is going to be voting on a resolution uh, early this year 
that is a resolution to boycott Israel. And this is a boycott. Sometimes for the commercial boycotts, there's there when when these these laws are challenges challenged the anti BDS laws because there are claims that uh, commercial boycotts uh, of Israel are protected by free speech. But there is no way, no way to defend academic boycotts of Israel. These are boycotts based upon national origin, meaning that somebody from Israel, it doesn't matter what their background is, it doesn't matter if they're Jewish or, or Arabic or if they're Christian, if they are, some of them maybe even might be supporters of, of boycott of Israel themselves. It doesn't matter what it is. It's the same way as we have terrorism in Israel that bombs a, 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 a bus and people blow up independent of who they are. They are, they are simply targeting Israelis based upon ethnicity and national origin. These are straight violations of federal anti-discrimination laws, and they are um, and, 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 and they, are, they are violating a variety of federal laws. And we are watching these cases closely. And, and depending on what happens here, we have uh, the ability and tools and resources in our hands to be able to, to push back against the academic uh, boycotts. I take it the people who are activating this uh, NATO boycott of Israel um, are doing it, they say, in support of the Palestinians. Am I correct? There was a company in Israel called SodaStream that was uh, that was operating in in, in near Ariel. Uh, it was over the Green Line, disputed territories, whatever you want to call it, of Israel. And they had a big factory factory there that was uh, employing Israelis and Palestinians, paying the Palestinians a uh, a wage that was much much higher than the normal wage in that area for for uh, for workers. And the BDS movement targeted them, and based upon this uh, this uh, pressure, the SodaStream actually closed this uh, factory and moved inside uh, in, in, into Israel, outside of that territory, into what people consider maybe Israel proper, somewhere near Beersheba in the south of of, uh, of Israel. And what that meant was that. Uh, the Palestinian workers, the hundreds of Palestinian workers that were employed and getting a good wage were now out, unemployed. They were out of work. So I, I believe if you ask those workers, they're going to tell you that it's not in our it's not in their uh, interest at all to uh, to have that factory closed. And that's exactly what they did say. So, um, you know, sometimes and all it, it's used the the claim of. Of, of supporting Palestinian rights and protecting the Palestinians, but it's being said sometimes from people that are far away and, and a lot of times are not really, don't really know what even the Palestinians themselves want. And that, that's a dangerous combination. It's, it's in my opinion, it's, it is oftentimes used as a, as a propaganda tool to, to gain sympathy and to come across as a civil rights, human rights type of organization, even if it in, in no way actually helps the Palestinians, which they claim to be trying to help. Yes, it's interesting. Before I uh, move over to speak with uh, Lizzie about uh, Zionist on campus, I want to I want to give you and hopefully Liz is listening to this. Um, I give you one anecdote uh, that I gave on another show, and this is what I do um, in combating the lies of what people who profess to be pro-Palestinian, where they really don't give a damn about the Palestinians. I gave a talk in Amsterdam a few years ago uh, at the. Um, the Jewish Liberal Center, and uh, my talk was infiltrated by three of the leading members of BDS in Holland. And after I gave my 40-minute address and came to Q&A, one of the BDS guys uh, wanted to stand up and talk about all the crimes that Israel was committing. Of course, at that time, something you touched on, uh, there were sort of flotillas going on because there was what they call a a boy, um, a, 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 a a, 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 a sort of a siege on Gaza, which was a legal one. But they were saying that uh, Israel was starving the poor people of Gaza, the poor Palestinians, nothing was going through and everything. Uh, this illegal blockade, they called it. Uh, and I asked the BDS guy, who had BDS stickers on his shirt, um, tell me, how many trucks a day go into Gaza from Israel? It was a question he didn't want to answer. 
So I gave him the answer. I said, uh, according to official record, this is a time where he, he would profess it was a, an illegal blockade. 800 trucks a day were going into Gaza from Israel. So you're protesting about a boycott with actually what was boycotted was making sure that no military uh, uh, material or weapon uh, building material was going in. But 800 trucks a day were still going in to Gaza from Israel. But however, I told the guy, and this is the message that maybe Lizzie can work in, in more than a, than a legal process, a process, more an explanation process. I said, you profess to be doing everything in support of the Palestinians. So why aren't you protesting against the Egyptian illegal blockade of Gaza? Because I asked him how many trucks are going into Egypt every day into Gaza. Didn't want to answer. So I told him, Zippo. Zero, none. So I says, how many times have you gone to The Hague and demonstrated outside the Egyptian embassy? Or, put another way, how many times have you protested on behalf of the murder of Palestinians in Syria by the Assad regime, who at that time had just barrel bombed a refugee camp, killing an estimated 3,000 Palestinians? Never spoke up against it once. So these people who profess to be pro-Palestinians are absolutely silent when it comes to either Egypt, Jordan, Syria, even, uh, even also uh, Lebanon, taking actions against Palestinians in their countries as well. Totally silent. The hypocrisy is enormous. And uh, now I want to come on to uh, the Zionist on campus. Um, and uh, I want to introduce you to Lizzie McNeil. Lizzie, welcome to The View from Israel. Hi, thank you for having me. I just hope you got my last point because this is the way that I activate my activism on behalf of Israel. You know, uh, Lizzie, I want to tell you, Israel is kept protected. The nine, nearly 10 million people in Israel are protected by a force, fighting force called the Israel Defense Forces. But the one method of, of defense is actually going on the attack against the enemies that want to kill you. And basically what's going on on campuses in your country is the, although the Jewish students and the pro-Israel students are not being killed, they're being silenced, they're being threatened, and, 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 and this sort of activity. Lizzie, I want you to tell me and also um, our viewers some of the horrendous activities that are going on against Jewish students and pro-Israel students on, on campuses and why it's so important that you have Zionists on campus. Okay, well, firstly, thank you for having me. Um, I think it's important just to know a little bit about where I come from. I'm a graduate of Temple University. And after I graduated, I actually served in the army in Israel. Um, and what led me to do that is on campus, I felt incredibly silenced and confused and intimidated. Um, I remember specifically being a freshman and walking through the most populated area on campus and seeing a huge wall. Um, I grew up going to a very liberal Quaker school, and so I really was not used to ever seeing anything like this. Um, and I heard people yelling. And I heard things about Jewish people and Israel, so I confronted them. And I began to get yelled at by um, what I later knew was the SJP, the Students' Justice in Palestine. Um, the way that I actually met the rabbi on campus was he came up to me and he, he pulled me away and said, you're interested in Israel, you're interested in um, Judaism, come join um, Chabad and learn. And that's how I got involved with um, Jewish studies on campus. What's lacking on campus is that students um, who support Israel and are Jewish are not given the resources to speak up against the lies that are said about Israel. I think that Jewish students are often blamed for the actions of the Israeli government, um, which is not fair because we don't hold students accountable for um, the actions of other countries' governments. So why is there this double standard? 
Um, I would be in class participating in a in a Jewish studies class, and Israel would be brought up, and um, the idea that we are colonizers, that we took over the land, um, things like that would come up in class. And I would sit there and I had this IDF patch on my backpack and I felt incredibly uncomfortable, but I didn't have the tools to even know how to stick up for myself or what was considered um, a violation of um, viewpoint discrimination or Title VI. So the point of Zionists on campus is that we have spoken to tons of students all across the United States with similar stories as mine. Um, and what we're doing is that we're going to change the game and we're providing resources um, for students to understand what their rights are and how to document anti-Semitism on campus properly. Um, recently, we had a, a student from UCLA who is driven to change the conduct code um, to include Jewish students um, as a protection because she feels on campus they're not protected um, as a minority and um, that she wants that in their contact code. So we sat in with a meeting with her um, dean of students. Um, another situation was I met a girl who um, was actually yelled at in student government um, and called a Nazi um, at her university. And she um, later actually went on to um, participate in a rally and um, is using her, her voice and her activism to, to stand up. Um, we have another student who is actually an ambassador of ours, and he wrote an article about why Jewish students um, or Jewish people in general are not colonizers to Israel. And um, he plans to put that into a student newspaper. Um, another incident happened at UConn, and a student reached out to us to just to see her rights and how we could help her. So in the future, um, what we're hoping to do is we're hoping to provide webinars. Um, most recently, we've decided to collaborate with a larger organization that um, has student ambassadors on campus as well. Um, and we're hoping that we can collaborate with other existing organizations and all play on the same team and provide webinars to students so that they know what their legal rights are, how they can document anti-Semitism on campus, um, and how they cannot be silenced. Because I think, as you said before, that's the, the main issue right now is that there is, there's silence and, and apathetic administration, and that's what we need to, to work on. And, and this is the reason I think that uh, Zionist on Campus is, should be such an important uh, organization. Tell us some of the, um, the actions and the directions that you'll be taking Zionist on campus. What are you doing now? What do you hope to be doing in the future? So as of now, we have a social media that focuses on providing information, easily accessible information to students, um, parents, anyone who's interested on what a Title VI violation, for example, is, what a viewpoint discrimination violation is, um, how to as I mentioned before, document anti-Semitism properly and how they can report it and send it into is a whole legal institute. Um, that is one project that we work on. Another project is that the webinars, we are starting to um, hopefully in January, 2022, we're gonna open up these webinars, um, whether they're for congregations or for adults of um, students who are entering college, there's, a big gap, I think, of information that is lacking. I think Jewish people don't know what or how they can stand up for themselves. And it's often scary because sometimes these um, this intimidation turns violent. Um, even on when I was a student on campus, I had a peer who um, was assaulted for even just having a conversation with someone that was part of um, SJP on campus. And we're seeing that all over the media. Um, recently, someone was assaulted, I think in New York, um, for wearing an IDF sweatshirt. So there's just so many layers of harassment that's happening. And if we can do the, the niche that we have, and that is providing legal assistance and education, then that's a huge thing, I think, and a step in the right direction. Um, we also hosted a fundraiser last year in Tel Aviv. Um, that was very successful, and 
it not only raised money to provide these resources, but it, it was a celebration of, of Zionism and, and Israel and being Jewish. Um, and I think that that's also what we need is we need people to feel proud to be Jewish and they need to feel proud to be Zionist. And um, there's ways to do that. And that's kind of the direction that we are going. And I think it's vitally important for people like you, Lizzie, and um, uh, can be that. And with the help of Zachor, create a safe environment for these people. Uh, but if anybody's on campus and they're suffering from acts of anti-Semitism or, or any hate crimes, how do they contact you? And how do you bring this uh, to um, people like organizations like Zachor and Ron? So the way that people can contact us is through our website, which also has educational material on BDS um, and the claims of apartheid in Israel. So those are also great resources that if students do have questions and they don't know um, how to maybe um, speak up against the lies that are told about Israel, that's also a way to um, look for more information. But the way that they can contact us is through um, our email, uh, it's lizzie at zionistoncampus.org, or you can reach out through social media. We have an Instagram page as well as a Facebook page and a website. I mentioned uh, about uh, 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 this incident that I had when I was in Holland, and it, it really uh, forced me or created me to, to write the book called BDS for Idiots, which is really a handbook for, for students. It's an easy read, and yeah, your your students and people who get this book will be surprised about how easy it is to um, to knock down the a lot of the emotional arguments of uh, of the anti-Israel mob. Um, and quite frankly, they as I mentioned, which what happened in 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 Amsterdam, that they were talking about an illegal blockade on Gaza at that time, which wasn't illegal and it wasn't a blockade. But the same people who are supposed to be pro-Palestinians don't give a damn about the Palestinians in other attitudes. And this book is quite frankly full of these sort of anecdotes. And the students that have read this book have found it valuable because at the end of the day. You're not going to dissuade the fanatical BDS activists and the leaders. It's the middle grounds. It's the heart of mind, if you're on the campus, of the students who come on there not really understanding the situation at all. Those are the people that you can persuade. And I, I hope, Lizzie, that you, you're uh, going to be able to do this. Um, uh, Lizzie, as I said, I'm going to promote your... Uh, your Zionist on campus at the end of the uh, the show, but I have one final question for Ron. Um, I understand that something called the OCR uh, to investigate the UCLA for Title 11 violations based on complaints that were filed both by you at the Zahor Legal Institute and also Stand With Us. Stand With Us also is a valuable, very valuable resource for materials and help for students on campus, and I think that uh, Zionists on campus should actually coordinate with some with us, um, as well as other organizations. Ron, what could you tell us about this uh, uh, investigation of UCLA? A couple of years ago, UCLA announced that they were hosting the National Students for Justice in Palestine Convention. Uh, at that time, we had Jewish students on campus that were very uncomfortable about this happening. Uh, they were used to just the, the UCLA chapter of Students for Justice in Palestine engaging in actions that were um, that made them uncomfortable and that were anti-Semitic. And to bring activists from all over the country to our campus was not something that they they wanted. Um, we talked with the administrators of UCLA on their behalf. And what we found was that the UCLA administrators, as well as now we found it to be a pattern of university throughout the country, um, it responded and said something like, well, you know, we're a university. Universities are meant to be the beacons of free speech. And so we allow all speech on campus. Um, 
So what that that really, in fact, made us look like the good guys because here we are, the bad guys. Here we are, the Hor Legal Institute coming in and reminding them that not all speech is is protected or allowed on campus. But that's not a real good look on campuses. And more than that, it didn't work because the administrators at San Francisco State, when they had a uh, when they had a, a a a one of the terrorists of one of the LL planes that was part of a university-sponsored se session. When we talked to them, they said the same thing. At Northeastern, they said the same thing. We allow everything. And so one of the, well, so if we continue on then with, uh, with UCLA, once the conference began, uh, the UCLA students documented anti-Semitic activities that were happening at the, camp at the conference. And what we ended up doing was on their behalf, filing a Title VI complaint, a, with the Office of Civil Rights, which is a uh, department within the, de the Department of Education. Um, they reviewed our, uh, our complaint, they talked with the students, and they understood from that that there, was a, that there was incidents that had happened on campus that were worth investigating. And so they now have opened up a official investigation into, uh, into this event. Um, for us, this is an important thing because it is, it, is, it is really the first time that there is an investigation by the Office of Civil Rights that's not the classic anti-Jewish anti hatred, but something related to Israel as a proxy for, um, for uh, Jews. And so this is the first time that the Office of Civil Rights has, has uh, announced that they are doing an investigation based upon anti-Israel types of activities on campus. And we're very hopeful that they will uh, come down with um, a penalty for UCLA that will cause not just UCLA to take action, but campuses throughout the country to stand up and take notice. Um, this was actually one of the uh, Focal uh, events for us in starting on Zionists on campus because basically what we understood is that the administrators were going to allow everything to happen on campus, and that's really very simple for them to do when they're a progressive or a progressive university and they are supporting what's considered a progressive group. And it's hard for me to understand why anti-Israel groups are considered progressive, but. Today, in today's day and age, they are. And so, when they were, uh, when they, when there was an anti-Israel group that was uh, that was uh, giving statements that were making the Jewish feel, students feel uncomfortable, and that were anti-Semitic according to the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism, the the university administrator said everything is fine. But what we wonder is. Are they going to take that same act action when an organization that, for whatever reason, is not considered progressive, like a Israel rights group, also comes out with provocative types of statements? And so one of the things that we're going to try to do with, Zion with Zionists on campus is to cause the administrators to really get in the situations where they have to decide, do they really consider do they really protect free speech for all, or is it just free speech for those whose messaging they like? And the First Amendment it protects against something called viewpoint di discrimination, which means that if you're going to allow one group to uh, to give their opinions or to rent to be able to use uh, school resources or whatever, you have to be able to get, give all groups the the same rights. And so we want to test and see whether these administrations and progressive schools are really going to give these rights to all of the uh, to to the to the pro-Israel groups as well. And that's one of the actual focal points of Zionists on campus is to speak with students. And when these situations occur, work with the with the students and help them talk with the administrators to ensure that the Jewish students and the Jewish groups are getting uh, the same full rights as all the other organizations on campus. I have to tell you, Ron, um, speaking personally, I dislike the word uh, uh, progressive because progressivism is really a soft peddling what is really radicalism. And when people go on campus say, to criticize Israel, and this criticism makes Israel more fascist than the fascists, more Nazis than the Nazis, and, 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 um, and practices a, an apartheid, far more lethal and dangerous than the apartheid of South Africa. You have to look for another word for criticism. But what it really is, 
it's really how they practicing thought these days on campuses in America. And that is a dangerous part. And you have to call it out for what it is. And this is why it's so important that you run at Zahor Legal Institute and you, Lizzie, at Zionist on campus, that your work is so essential and so important. And I want to thank both of you for being on the show today. How can people get hold of you? How, if people are interested in this video, how can they contact Zahor or how can they contact you, Lizzie, on Zionist on campus? So for, to, to, to get, oh, go Lizzie. Uh, we can be contacted through social media as well as email. You can email me, Lizzie, L-I-Z-Z-Y, -Z at zionistoncampus.org, or you can find us on our website, zionistoncampus.org. Zahor Legal Institute website is uh, Z-A-C-H-O-R legal, L-E-G-A-L dot org. Uh, we also can be found on the social media as well, and uh, we're happy to have people come visit our site and, uh, and learn about what we're doing. And uh, we welcome comments, and we're very good at getting back to people. Thank you, Lizzie, and thank you, Ron, and thank you, viewers. I hope you will share this video. Click the like button. Also, click subscribe because this helps it to uh, put out the video to far more people as well and please share it if you found that this video is important again i appeal to you share the video with other people and uh, i want to thank you for joining the view from israel this is barry shaw saying thank you very much shalom from israel